Scott Gleason, and I produce the radio and television news for the College of Agriculture and Consumer and Environmental Sciences, University of Illinois Extension. Uh, I'm in Champaign with the fighting line. I write the basement of Dr. Paul. That's the home of the Agricultural College there. Uh, if you look down in the corner of your brochure, it says willag.org. That's actually the name of a website. Uh, circle that. We do markets and weather every day. We do a program called the Closing Market Report from one call to one week. I've got some questions for you up front. First, how many of you are farmers? Raise your hands. How many farmers do we have? We link. Well, uh, third of the crowd, so I'm going to look around. Bankers of credit. Okay. Here, because you're an investor, associated in the ag industry in some way, or a dealer of some form. All right. Have you got an idea of where we're headed today? Uh, one quick thing. On the Danforth Center, I was there when they opened the Danforth Center uh, about a decade ago. This is a really great place. At that point in time, we were thinking that it would become the mecca of biotechnology. That was the phrase that we used. Uh, the Danforth Center is a fantastic biotechnology development place. Uh, I got to meet uh, former President Jim Carter at that point. He's uh, a backer of that, and as you know, Carter, he's been working on for a long time uh, Africa and a way to get them to be self-sustainable and to have some crops there that would work. So we're going to talk about uh, farm policy and ag lending. I'm going to let the folks up here introduce themselves. The important part of the whole conversation today is this is about a conversation with you, not with myself and our panelists. So I'm going to need your help. I know that half of the room I got to and said, hey, help me out. I need to know what you want asked which means you have to hold up your hand, right? And if you hold up your hand, you can ask any question that you want of these folks up here. Let's have them introduce themselves. I probably will. We'll start with Mike Heckman. Mike is uh, the Central Region President, uh, I'm sorry, Mike's the Central Region President of CoBank. Thanks for being with us, Mike. Can you tell me a little bit about your background and what CoBank does? Am I on? I guess I am. Yeah, these come on on hand. All right. Uh, Mike Heckner managed the uh, central region of the United States for CoBank. CoBank's about $120 billion bank, primarily lending to co-ops. Uh, so they're more involved in more of the processing and marketing, finance, uh, rural infrastructure, water, communications, things like that. Bill Davis is with us. He's the Senior VP and Chief Credit Officer at Farm Credit Services. Bill? Um, uh, Bill Davis, Chief Credit Officer, uh, uh, Farm Credit Services of America and Frontier Farm Credit. Uh, we have a portfolio of about $26 billion, along with about 60,000 loan customers in five states. Uh, about 80% of our loan volume is loan producers, farmers and ranchers, about 20% of uh, agribusiness. So the two of you service really two different places. And are there any other differences? We're cooperative, both cooperatives on it. Uh, a lot of difference. Both members of the farm credit system will get our funding from the same source of sale of federal farm, farm credit bonds. All right, now let's move to the farm policy side of this issue. Jonathan Kopp is here. He is the director of the Bach Ag Policy Center at the University of Illinois. Good morning to you, Jonathan. Tell them a little bit about your background. Well, good morning, Todd. Thanks for, for having me up, General. Uh, yeah, I'm currently at the University of Illinois. I teach ag law and ag policy classes, work on extension work and outreach. Um, my background, I grew up on a farm in Ohio, actually not too far from uh, Mr. Pants. Um, went to uh, law school, pulled that against me. Um, as long as I argued with everybody in my family, so they sent me off. Uh, and worked in D.C. for about a year. So I had the incredible uh, pleasure and honor and, and experience of working on the last two farm bills uh, in the Senate Ag, in, in the U.S. Senate and down at USDA. He says the incredible honor, but he wrote a lot of the last two farm bills. So if you didn't like them, <laughs> that's not fair. <laughs> Don Newton is here as well. He's the director of market intelligence at the American Farm Federation. You have an interesting background. Tell me about it. Uh, well, first of all, Kevin, thanks for having me. Uh, everybody in this room probably knows what Farm Bureau does, and, and what we do is we uh, work with leaders in Washington, D.C. to communicate the needs of farmers and ranchers uh, across the country. Uh, my background, I'm from uh, Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, my family had a small farm just right outside the city. 
Uh, went to the Ohio State University. I uh, did a short stint with Jonathan on the Senate Ag Committee, uh, working on the last farm bill. I uh, was chief economist for National Milk Producers Federation for about a year. I uh, joined the Farm Bureau team back in June of this year. And finally, Dead Center is Joe Outlaw. I don't know whether Dead Center is the right place to put you or not, Joe. Maybe not. Uh, he's the co-director of Ag and Food Policy Center at Texas A&M. Good morning to you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the invitation to be here. Obviously, uh, the older of the policy guys, I guess. Uh, I've been doing farm policy for about 30 years down in Texas A&M. Uh, we have partnered with the Factor Group here at the University of Missouri for uh, for all that time. And what we generally do is do a lot of analysis for Congress and their staff back behind the scenes. So we've been uh, working on foreign policy, uh, making it right, making it wrong for quite some time. As a reporter, there are a couple places that I go. He mentioned Factory, which is Food and Agricultural Policy Research Institute, if I remember correctly. Uh, I like to visit their website a lot. If you have not, go visit that website. And then, because I am at the University of Illinois, the Farm Doc Daily website, the Farm Doc Daily, uh, Illinois, uh, EDU. Let's talk about uh, the current state of farm liquidity. We'll start with the bankers down on the end. What do we think about the current state of farm uh, liquidity, and what does it really mean? Um, Bill, we'll start with you. Uh, farm liquidity, I, I guess, uh, as we look at our, as I mentioned, we, we finance a lot of production agriculture in our part of the world. That mostly means corn and soybeans on the grain side, with a little bit of wheat on the western side of our area. Uh, you know, uh, as far as liquidity in our producers' uh, uh, balance sheets, we've seen a pretty severe erosion of liquidity over the last two to three uh, crop cycles. Uh, we. Uh, uh, but it came from a position of, of strength. Uh, there, uh, most of our customers were coming off anywhere from five to seven years of record profit. Uh, so we entered that period uh, with our producers in, in uh, uh, record position as far as liquidity and uh, balance sheet strength, overall solvency. Uh, you've seen those numbers from USDA too, and it would uh, be very reflective in our portfolio on average. Uh, we've seen that erode in the last two, two lending cycles. Uh, we've been busy the last lending cycle. We'll be busy again this winter uh, looking for ways to help our customers restore liquidity. Uh, rebalancing and restructuring of their debt is one of the ways we can help with that. But we're also asking our customers to focus on ways that they can restructure and, and uh, take a look at their asset base and what's productive and what's not, and how bad do you need the assets that are productive in your operation, and is that a way that you can contribute to restoring liquidity in your balance sheet? When you ask one of your clients to restructure their debt, to rebalance, what does that mean on their end as it refers to the assets? Well, I think the most common method to do that is, uh, you know, we have a lot of capital purchases that were made uh, in the course of the last five to seven years out of cash. So we're, we're placing debt against some of those capital purchases that were made. Uh, it means pledging more collateral, generally, in land. Uh, that's where 85% of the assets of the ag sector are in land. So it generally means taking a look at, at putting more debt against real estate and stretching that over a reasonable repayment period. Uh, we also saw our producers finance uh, land purchases on uh, even five, seven, and ten year paybacks. And, 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 and uh, traditionally, we looked at 20 and 30 year financing. So we're doing some of that. Bill, how is it you deal with producers uh, or deal with uh, the co ops uh, and the other places that you deal with? And they come in and they say, hey, we've got an awful lot. Of in money invested, wrapped up here, um, we need to think about how to refinance as well. But like, what do you hear from that industry? Are they funded okay? Or, I'm, I'm sorry, Mike. I'm talking yeah. okay. Are, are they funded all right? I wanted to see what Bill was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to see what Bill was going to say too, yeah, but I'm sure maybe you have the right answer. Um, well, 2008, I want to start back to there. So two th when 2008 hit, and we all remember what happened then, we found a lot of co-ops that were involved in, um, in handling grain were short on liquidity, um, but also relatively short on overall long-term debt. 
So when that time hit, and of course well, they had a great need for even more liquidity, uh, one of the things that we did at that time was put more term loans in and created quite a bit of liquidity and then put more leverage in the balance sheet with term debt. Subsequent years up till about now, uh, had some pretty good earning years. I mean, they kind of mirror what happened with the uh, producer side. So those earnings then did a pretty nice job of beginning to digest some of that term debt. Um, now at the same time, they were doing capital improvements, so they didn't eliminate all the term debt, but they managed it very well. So we're at a spot right now where liquidity is actually quite good for most of the co-ops. In pretty good shape with that. Term debt, I would say, is very manageable. One of the things that we'll begin to start to see is some um, holdback and capital improvements just just until we kind of right size this and kind of figure out where the margins are coming from. Questions from out here all along, all the way along. I'll be asking, has anybody got one that they want answered yet? When you do, just hold up your hand. I'll make sure that we get to it. Okay. So the question that Kevin said, we're going to ask everybody, and Jonathan, I'll start with you. What's the deal with Trump as it moves forward related to agricultural policy in Washington, D.C.? <clears throat> wow. Um, I mean, I think there's a lot of unknowns, right? I mean, I think that we, we just don't necessarily know where they're going to go. I think the trade issue is a huge concern um, and how that, particularly with prices being where they are now, uh, we've got a farm bill rewrite coming up here in a couple years. That's going to have a big, uh, they're going to have a, an input on that. Um, and just sort of the, the you know, the, the, the calendar in D.C., all the things that have to go through in short order, uh, from appointments to budget issues and, and health care and on and on, that, you know, how does that begin backing up into the usual calendar we see on farm, farm bill rewrite? So I think there's a lot going on at this point. I think it's really hard to to guess on, on what, what it's going to look like, it should be uh, a lot to watch. John Newton from AFBS perspective. I think John is right. There are a lot of unknowns. What we're doing is, is communicating uh, what we'd like to see. Uh, there are certainly a lot of issues uh, with the administration that we'd like them to be aware of, the importance of trade. Uh, the importance of, of NAFTA as far as Mexico and Canada as trading partners. Uh, we're, we're very focused on immigration, having a, a seasonal and, and reliable workforce, uh, making sure that people understand that. Uh, we're obviously very focused on the Farm Bill. We anticipate that there'll be hearings uh, in the spring on the Farm Bill, so we're, we're gearing up for that. We've had uh, our Farm Bill working group uh, with state staff go ahead and start thinking about uh, how some of these programs from Art County to PLC to dairy and cotton can be improved to provide a better safety net uh, for farmers. So we're proceeding on, on a lot of the important issues uh, that are important to Farm Bureau, but we also recognize that it's a wait and see. We want to see uh, who, who the appointees are, uh, who we're going to have to work with at USDA. Uh, so it's, it's a wait and see, but we have a lot of things on the agenda that we'd like to see about. Well, John, I know that's, that's the lobby side of you. That's very calm. <laughs> but are, are you excited? Are you worried? Really, in the halls, what does it say? <laughs> so I'll, I'll <laughs> yeah, that's that's the thing, I depend on you. Well, I, think, I think one of the things that we look at is, is that rural America spoke. Uh, we think that our farmers and ranchers came out and spoke. Uh, and we look for this administration to be friendly with farmers. Uh, we think we played a, a big hand in getting him in the office, uh, so we look forward to, to what comes next. Do you think you can depend on him to do it? In the joke. But <laughs> 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 that's really that's really kind of the question. Rural America came out. Can can they depend on Donald Trump to do it? Oh. I mean, we're just gonna wait and see more. Joe, what do you have to say about Trump? Uh, you know, I like these other guys. It's, it's, it's really early, but at the same time, if you, if you don't think we're going to change and, and focus on some of the regulations that's been uh, threatening agriculture, like waters and things like that, I think, I think those things are, are about to be changed. Um, I actually see, I'm very optimistic about this. 
I, I actually see that uh, there's an opportunity for him to use some business principles in Washington, which would be a little bit different than, than what we had over time, over my career anyway. Uh, I'm not going to say that we're going to like every one of those business principles because they kind of get applied, but uh, the fact of the matter is I think I like everyone else, and we need to see what happens with the, with the appointments before I start rolling around the third place. Mike and Bill, I, I suppose you have some thoughts on this. Maybe it refers to deregulation of the banking and finance industry, but where do you stand? Let's we'll start with you, Bill. Well, I, I think as we look at, at our highest areas or focus of concern in legislation, it's it's crop insurance, it's maintaining the RFS, and it's the regulation for uh, on our producers more so than on the banking uh, regulations. I think the banking regulations will get slow down reverse some, and I think that's a positive thing, but uh, regulations that affect our customers are probably the highest priority for us, and I think the new administration uh, represents a positive outlook for things going on there. And as far as, as crop insurance and the RFS, uh, it looks like we've got support there, and, and our feedback from our legislative uh, contacts is that, that we think we're, we're solid over the crop insurance for the most part, and, and in our best. Will you be in the room? Will Farm Credit be in the room when those discussions are taking place about uh, the RFS, uh, about crop insurance, we about are, our appeals? We do. Expect to be at the table. We have uh, several <coughs> legislative positions or full-time positions across the system. Uh, we're in D.C. Uh, regularly with those folks, and and yeah, we will we will lobby for for those those. Uh, Broad-based uh, programs that affect our customers. Mike, your thoughts on Donald Trump? Well, I, I think I'd probably share what Bill said. I, I think that you know, I think we all have to be optimistic. We're um, optimistic about things. We're trying to be that way. I think, in addition to what Bill said, we're looking for some relief from OSHA on a lot of a lot of things that they've been um, um, asking. Our cooperative customers to do so. That's one thing I would add to that. John, you have something to add? Yeah, one of the things when we when I travel around and, and talk to members, it's not prices that are the big problem to them. They can deal with marketing. It's the regulations. They just want to get regulations out of the way so they can go out and farm, and that's something that, that we want to work on. Uh, Wotus, uh, we want to get that repealed. Uh, that's going to take several years to craft uh, some alternative on the Clean Water Act. That's that's one of our biggest priorities: is getting regulations out of the way and letting farmers farm. Questions out here? Yeah, I got I got one, Joe. Well, who's the odds on the uh, Secretary Act? <laughs> what, who are the names? Who's the top of the list? In your guys' opinion, I think. I think to be honest with you, this is going to sound easily like most economists, but. Uh, <laughs> uh, the reality is this, when you look at the secretary options, there, there's a lot, and there, he's betting people every, every day. Uh, I tended to look, and I should have said this earlier, I've looked at who's on the transition team for agriculture, and it's a lot of people that you guys would be excited about being, being on that team. So the reality is this, unless something comes out of left field, it's going to be somebody who is very, very supportive of, pro of production agriculture. Uh, I know that there's a person from Texas on the list, and I would say that uh, this is going to hurt me, but uh, I think he's one of the least qualified people I've heard about. <laughs> yes? functions that they'd like to find relief in and how that might impact, impact funding in the next five to seven years. You know, Lotus is obviously a big one. Uh, we're working a lot with issues in Chesapeake Bay, uh, in, in the Maumee watershed, some of those issues on, that are impacting agriculture. Uh, you know, we work with some of the regu regulations on the poultry industry, for example, the, the organic rules on, on egg-laying flocks, that's, that's a very controversial issue right now that we've 
voice our concerns about and what that will do to the poultry industry. Uh, we, we work on issues, obviously the farm bill, uh, you know, that, that could probably provide the most direct relief in the near term. Uh, making sure that these safety nets are fixed uh, so that farmers have uh, you know, some sort of risk management program in place uh, to help smooth incomes in the event that, that, that prices continue to fall. And then the other, the other big one is, is trade. I mean, obviously, uh, working on expressing the importance of trade, and moving product, improving demand can only help prices. And so we're working on a lot of issues to try to help that farmer's balance sheet. Got another question for the farmers in the audience. How many of you are from one of the nine Corn Belt states? So that would be from Kansas, North Dakota, Ohio. Anybody that wants to do? Anybody from the west, from west of there down to Texas? A couple. And how many from the southern states? Right. So this, this, these, I'm kind of dividing farm policy issues up here. That's roughly speaking the way we think about it. So we have the west, uh, and we have the Corn Belt, and then we have the southern states. What's on the agenda for farm policy? You've given us a couple of things, but what, what's really on the agenda that might change the farm policy? Well, <clears throat> what we're going through right now is certainly evaluating and trying to better understand <clears throat> excuse me, how the programs are working with this price downturn. So this revenue, uh, our county revenue program, the BLC program, we're trying to get a sense. So we've been having some really fascinating listening sessions with farmers around Illinois about you know, how is this working in your, in your planning and what, do you, you know, what things need to be improved or changed to go forward. So I think a lot of that, uh, the next farm bill, farm policy discussion is going to revolve around uh, here are the programs we have now, what changes, what, what modifications. Uh, you know, the, the challenge that we always talk about in these, in these discussions that I think we always have to be very aware of, and I would presume it would be the same challenge you know, with the new Congress and new administration. It's going to be budgetary. What funding is available to do anything more or make any major changes with it? And, you know, we found this in the last farm bill, and I doubt it changes much this time around. That what the Congressional Budget Office says is available in the program becomes the biggest limiting factor on what you can do. And then if political pressure comes to bear to cut spending even further, you've got that much more limit than what can be done. So as we've gone around and around that discussion about what would you like to see, how would you change it, we keep coming back to well, what, you know, figuring out what that's going to cost and how that plays out and what is likely to be a difficult process, um, both just budget-wise and political. How many of the listening sessions have we done so far? These are farm bill listening sessions that are about uh, 50 questions that farmers have clickers and they answer. How, how many have we had so far? And have, you, have you categorized any of the results or have a rough feel for what some of the primary results are? We've done three major ones, and then the groups have done, I think, maybe another eight or nine or ten on top of that. They're running the numbers. So I have seen, we haven't seen any of the, the uh, compiled results, but you know, more of the uh, discussions that happen how it goes uh, through that is what I have now. But the, the actual survey results is when that information will come out. Later. Joe Outlaw on the farm policy, farm bill side, what's up for you? Yeah, this is, uh, it's been interesting. Our group uh, has been being asked for the last eight months to look at changes and do what if stuff behind the scenes. None of this is public, but uh, so there's a, there's, uh, <laughs> Uh, there, there's a lot of, of, of thought going into how to fine-tune. Uh, Jonathan's right. It's, it's going to evolve around how much money is available. Eventually, it always does. But, but the reality is, and this is where, it, it, you know, it's an interesting concept. Is the, is the farm safety net supposed to, what's it supposed to provide? There's lots of philosophies about that. I, don't, I wouldn't say someone's ideas are wrong. I'm just going to say that, in my opinion, the, the thing is, is uh, if, if we can keep the Title I part, the, the payment side, to be supportive when, when things are rough, and a strong uh, crop insurance at the same time, um, it's not all we're going to be able to do. And, and it's going to be, people can argue over what flavor of the month they like in terms of how those assistance comes, whether it's an area plan or a you know, price plan or a revenue plan. You can argue all you want to, but there's only going to be so much money. And, and the main thing is, is to make sure that crop insurance is strong. And like we found this time, 
I, I will be the first to admit I was one of those that was arguing against ARC um, because I didn't think it was going to provide enough support when things, if things went bad like they are right now. I'm not that smart. I didn't see it coming, but I just was saying that if it happened, it wasn't going to be that much support. Um, those types of arguments are still going to be out there. The, the reality is, is that what you need to understand is we're going into this in such different budgetary times. It was hard to get the Congress to get interested last time because things were so good. You were going in and having your fly-ins, the Farm Bureau was having fly-ins, and people were saying things were great. So they didn't really weren't all that interested in, in the safety net. Now we've got a completely different situation. I think the tone will be different, the seriousness will be different, uh, but I don't know if the results will be different. Yeah, so, so just to make sure we understand, so the Title I is the ARC and PLC side, right? And then uh, your crop insurance is a different, different uh, entity altogether. Title I'm sorry? Title I. Title I. It's Title I. So, so there are two different functions. Go on. Well, I, I'd say that farmers and ranchers, Jonathan, last year on Bill, we took our cut. We cut money. And when we talk to farmers and ranchers around this time around, we don't want to take any more cuts. Budget neutral, that's, that's an option for discussion, uh, but we're not trying to cut spending anymore. Uh, when we've lost $50 billion in net farm income, uh, something needs to be done. And so we're, we're looking at all the options. You know, one of the biggest issues is, is discrepancies. There are a lot of guys out the cold. When your neighbor gets a $100 our county check and you don't, that impacts the competitive behavior of folks in an area. We want to work on that. Uh, cotton guys don't have an adequate safety net, so we want to work on that. Uh, we've heard from dairy farmers, no matter what state we go to, that their safety net's broke. So we need to fix that. Uh, the budget is, is a very real challenge. Finding the money to fix these things is a very real challenge. Uh, but we started that process, and, and when we have fly-ins and our members come in this time around, they're going to be very serious because this, these are real issues, are real challenges. Statistically, how hard will it be to fix the, the next county, I'm in a county that didn't get an ARC payment, uh, and it's the only one in the state, and I'm in the middle of the state. There's one in Illinois called Pyatt, not very far from Champaign, and everybody else got a, got a payment. We know why they didn't get a payment, because their corn yields were so far above what their, what their APH was, but uh, how, hard, how hard statistically is that fix, be fixed, and should it be fixed, or does it work right? It's working exactly as designed by Congress. Uh, you know, don't get me wrong there, but there are discrepancies county to county. Uh, there are a lot of creative things that can be done. You can do, you know, mass districts. You can use RMA yields. Uh, people have suggested a lot of alternative ways uh, to trigger program payments under our county. Uh, so we're looking at that. Uh, longer sample periods. Does the Olympic moving average need to be five years versus seven years versus ten years? One of the things we have on our website at fb.org slash farmville resources are quantitative analyses of, of a lot of these different alternatives uh, that our state staff put together. So what does it look like if our county uh, is triggered based on state prices? Or if our county is triggered on a 10-year moving average for seven? How does that change uh, the distribution of program payments? Uh, how does that impact this disparity? So we, we continue to look at all those issues. Yep. So every year we have a trillion dollar deficit in the, uh, in the federal spending. Why do we need a Department of Agriculture? Why do we need a Department of Energy? And what, we're looking is, for ways to balance the budget. Why do we need those two departments? Why not just eliminate the USDA and the Department of Energy? No. I'm, I'm happy to answer that question. <laughs> uh, the, you know, the farm bill is a one trillion dollar package. Eighty percent of that is nutrition programs uh, for needy families to put food on the table. That's where a lot of that money goes to. USDA quarterbacks that program. Uh, farm programs, commodity programs, kind of wants a small share of the USDA budget. Crop insurance is you know, about forty three billion over ten years. Commodity programs about forty three billion over ten years. And the total farm program spending is only about 2% of the U.S. budget in total. So getting rid of the USDA or getting rid of the Department of Energy, I don't think it's going to fix uh, that financial problem that, that you referenced. And it will leave a lot of people without food on the table. So there's a lot of positives uh, from the USDA. The USDA is a huge agency, obviously, uh, with, with, with regard to uh, inspection service, grain marketing, 
let's just be realistic about it. And, and, and uh, Newton is right that, that you're not going to balance the budget of this country off, off of doing what you just what you just mentioned in regards to doing away with USDA. I don't have the numbers on energy because I don't pay that much attention to it. That's not what I do. But the reality is, is that uh, there are, if you take a pie chart of, of what we spend in this country and you start looking at Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid, that's going to be most of what you want to talk about. So I always find it very interesting where people come and say, we've got to balance the budget, we've got to look at agriculture, which is one of the very smallest pieces of that national budget pie. You're not going to do it that way. You're going to have to get put your big boy pants on and look at other things that people don't want to do. So it, it gets to kind of be, uh, I understand your point. Agriculture has, has had more cuts than basically any other major commodity, any other major title of uh, the government spending that I have known. And this guy can tell you if I'm right or wrong on this, but I have not seen the other areas of, of, of the federal government cut near as much as agriculture has voluntarily given up. Now, <clears throat> so one of the things I think is fast, and I agree with both comments, the, something Joe just said that really jumps out. We had this conversation, cut spending, cut spending, cut spending, in 2005. If you recall, the debt ceiling was used as sort of a hostage force. And what amazed me, and this, what amazed me is every time we said it, and that was in Congress at the time, we, we said there, and the first word was after cut spending was, and start with farm growth, start with agriculture. And we could never figure out why we were the everybody's favorite first topic to cut. And, you know, so what I caution, to, and to Joe's point, is whenever that conversation turns to cutting spending, just know you guys get to be first in line for some reason. I don't agree with it. I don't know why that is the case, but it is the poster child for this is where we start. And in 2011, if you go back to that wonderful mess that, that came after the debt ceiling with the super committee, the Ag Committees in Congress were the only ones that actually sit down both chambers, both parties, and work out actual reductions in spending. We didn't get any too much pressure for it. We took our beatings for it in many ways. But that's where this conversation came to, to, to sort of drift. And so we talk about CBA, we talk about baseline and concerns about what's available and not taking any more. And the big red flag that I throw up is the moment that conversation in Congress turns to we need to cut, cut, cut. It isn't. I mean, maybe it is Medicaid, and Medicare this time, maybe it is defense spending, all that. Any of those big ticket items get the hit. The first one's on the block is going to be, well, we got these farm payments going out, what do we do? And you will see, unless the world has changed so drastically, that I think you'll see that again in a budget focused discussion. And it becomes very difficult uh, to sort through. It's very difficult to make any changes John talks about. It becomes very difficult to navigate the politics around what you need. The coalition you need to actually get a bill through. And then we talk about a lot of the technology and, and, and things that are, you know, we, some great forward looking conversation. It makes it really hard to even, you know, adjust policy or think forward when you're basically in a defense mode uh, on, you know, on every aspect of it. So, you know, not to, not to get against it, I just, I, I think we want to, we want to have some care when we think about that. Budget conversation. Uh, just from a comment on that, from a lender's perspective, I think what we like to see out of it, and I think from a producer's perspective, is the commodity title program and the, the uh, crop insurance programs are run economically. Uh, they provide a lot of stability to this industry and what's already a really volatile industry. And if we didn't have that stability, it comes at a reasonable price, I think. Uh, but we, if we didn't have that stability, things would be a lot more volatile. And you would have to have more capital than you do today to get financing, and the cost of financing would be higher if the industry was more volatile than it already is. This industry does experience a uh, really a low risk premium as far as, as uh, uh, debt capital. Uh, and, and part of that's due to the stability of uh, the legal system we have in the U.S. and, and also due to the farm program we've got in the U.S. Mike, clearly crop insurance is an important part of the farm credit business model. Uh, and it is also a part of um, the way they link producers. Um, how about for your side when you're dealing with the co-ops? Well, 
the co-ops aren't going to be successful unless the farmers are successful. So fundamentally, any any of these things that have been talked about here that are good for the farmer are going to be good for the co-ops. I mean, co-ops only thrive to serve farmers, and and they'll have to adapt to all of the changes that are coming along because of what's going on with the farmers as well. Let's start down here with that question. So, so the question is about the history of policy, not only farm policy, not only here in the United States, but also in Europe, and whether it's actually about food policy or whether it's about land and conservation policy. Uh, and, and maybe you can back some of that up with some historical perspective to begin with on one side of the ocean. Hey, let me jump in real quick. I'm over here now. I'm telling you what some people have written in, so I'm just going to go with it. And that's as long as they want. They want to have insurance payments are going to be tied to conservation, best management practices, and if that's how the farmer is going to get paid is through doing these best of practices and conservation programs. That's going to be the balancing act. We, we field a lot of those questions as of late for this government. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll yeah, I think um, I think that's like actually that is a big and I think great question. We're seeing it uh, in the state of Illinois with nutrient loss reduction push on water quality issues. Lawsuit, Des Moines, everything else. How much more does that come to bear? How much does that become a risk that farmers need to manage that the policy should respond to or react to? Setting aside the budget challenges to making those changes, which are unknown at this point, I think you see more of it, and I think it does provide, um, from the congressional perspective, it does provide a very strong argument for what we do in farm policy. That that we are also making the largest investment in conservation on private lands through these through these programs. You know, crop insurance last time around, uh, we reattached the uh, conservation compliance, wetlands and highly available lands. And it, be, it came from that exact push to, uh, from environmental conservation concerns that the insurance program had not had that linkage. And, you know, one of the challenges is trying to work that with crop insurance to keep it forward looking and not mess up the indemnity and the um, uh, liability and the risk pool issues. That, so I, I think it becomes more and more of the conversation. Um, I, you know, the policy side of it, I'm not sure how that shapes it. I think just politically, it is a strong argument for what farmers do to do with their research. You know, the history of this, this actually, this idea started, um, Mr. Harkin, a uh, number of farm bills ago with conservation security program, uh, came up with this idea of uh, maybe tying. Uh, environmental payments more to uh, move, maybe try CSP as a, in my opinion, it was a kind of a test run to see how that, that was going to work in this country. The reality, I think, is this, and this is where the rubber meets the road. Uh, each, people like that, people like getting conservation payments, but at the same time, whenever they can't go and get finance with their lenders, they're, they're, they're not willing to give up the other types of support uh, so that they can maintain it. And crop insurance is just a hugely important part of getting loans for everyone in this room. So, I have another question out here. Go ahead, on somebody right here. Yes. First, if we're worried about balancing the budget, why, why does the federal government continue to buy land? And why do we give every country that has anything happen, we just dole out dollars to them? So, so worry about balancing the budget. Why does the United States buy land, and why do we support other countries? Anybody interested in taking that? I don't know. I didn't think so. <laughs> right here. Yes.
the specter of trade and Donald Trump. What does this mean to each of you? Joe, go for it. There have been, there has been, during the election process, there was a lot of rhetoric about being very, what most people would call protectionist, and that alarms uh, all of agriculture, or it should, and, and uh, some manufacturing, things like that. Uh, my, my sense, and I, I, I talk to people in Washington all the time about these issues, and again, until we really see who he puts in, in, in place at the top of, of the USDA, it would be unclear, but the, but the reality is, is, I think, in my opinion, I have seen softening. Now, I can't really give you a lot of really, I can't give you a lot of uh, examples, but I think I have seen softening from, from pre-election to post-election. And, and I'm hopeful that, and, and I expect this, like I said before, this transition team has a lot of people who really understand how important trade is agriculture. I do not believe they're going to let that go on, uh, addressed. Other questions? I know I have a bunch up here. Yes, sir. In the white. We we got some mics. We're going to bring out. If you just hold your hand up. If you got a question, we can get a mic over to you. There you go. So, from a regulatory perspective, you're, you're talking about USDA, and it was interesting when they brought up the Endangered Species Act, which is is really impacting agriculture from an access to technology standpoint, particularly in USDA and EPA, they continually go back and forth and say, well, EPA is not ready, well, USDA is not ready. You know, the standard for approval of trace is supposed to be, I think, 90 days. And on the chemical side, it's supposed to be 180 days on trade approval. The last two major trades that have come through, both on the Dow side and the Monsanto side, have taken between 15 and 1,800 days to get through those two agencies. So you see that changing going forward, um, are they going to be able to streamline it and, and get us the access to technology and agriculture that we need? I'm not sure how to answer that. The, the, the bureaucratic morass that, that, it, that you go through on these processes, you know, the three different agencies involved in trades and, and, and getting through, it, it's been difficult. I, I know that there has been a long effort trying to figure out how to fix or revise or, or streamline that. And, you know, <coughs> sitting here, I don't have a good answer. I don't know what a new administration can do uh, getting through that. I mean, it, it is a series of laws and regulations that they are sorting through. So it's not, you know, they just, it's not that they're not talking to each other. It's that, that they are working through a whole lot of issues and a whole lot of uh, hoops to go through. I, you know, this possible. It, you know, said, maybe there's a business actor in there that helps. Uh, it can work the other way. And what you think would work in business doesn't necessarily work in the regulatory structure and the bureaucratic structure of the federal government. So, I, again, one of those great unknowns that I, I don't know what, what you do or how, but I, I think it's a pressing issue. It's been a pressing issue for a while. Crop insurance has come under fire several times over the last several years. People have started to think about uh, different ways to self-insure themselves or having insurance in other forms. Is this a viable option? Are there things that really can work on? I think I'll start with the bankers now. Are there things that you think can be done in the private sector as opposed to, to uh, the governmental sector? Well, we've seen some, some add-on products that, that work, and we can sell some of those products for the crop insurance. So I think to enhance or customize maybe, uh, you know, a, an insurance risk management uh, package for an individual producer, there's some real viable options there from the private sector. The, the big question now when you look at the revenue protection along with the production protection that federal crop insurance provides and with the subsidy that's with it, uh, it, it would be difficult to replace that at, any, at a reasonable cost. Uh, that's my belief anyway. Uh, but yeah, we're, we're very, we do look at those private uh, uh, policies or, or private products and think they make a good supplement, but I don't see it replacing federal crop insurance. And Joe, if I remember right, actuarially the numbers are something like $1 input or premium from the farmer is, we always say 50% because it sounds better, but I think it's $2 subsidy. Is that right? It is. <laughs> it, uh, I guess it's close. 
<laughs> you you obviously have a different calculation on that. What's your what's your calculation? I, I don't really think of it that way. I guess I, I, I do have all the numbers and I'd have to look at it. I don't want to speak uh, out of turn. But, but, but frankly, with respect to, to crop insurance, to me, the big deal is that the U.S. system is, is the system that everybody else wants to design and based off of. So I think it's actually pretty good. And, and the fact that uh, to have the big pool uh, of producers all across the country uh, makes it where it, it helps you manage, mitigate the risk a lot more of those big losses everywhere. Uh, to me, I, I, anytime someone starts talking about privately insuring, they, they better have some real money because I've run across enough people in my, in my career that uh, were self-insuring and, and they are self-out. <laughs> We're running in on the end of our time. We've got some more questions back here. I want to go back to the ag lending section of this for a minute. And uh, one of the, you know, we've, we've come off of a period of, say, 15 years where we've had relatively cheap money for a very competitive environment, major institutions that, that, are, that, that were actively seeking deals to put money in the books. And um, it led to an environment where, um, you know, I would, I would call it a relatively easy mining environment for ag credit. Uh, and, and it led to a concentration in the sense that um, a lot of the institutions who were out there, farm credit, major banks, all of them, uh, provided this one-stop shopping. And one of the real concerns that I've had over the past 10 years that has evolved is that these individual producers have so much concentration of credit risk with one single source, and that's, that's only as good as their source can be. And the, the source can only be as good as their regulators allow them at any given point in time. And it, if you think of some of the lessons of the 80s, I mean, I remember well situations where people who didn't perhaps have the greatest balance sheet structure, but they had some diversity in their credit sources you know, had a better chance of surviving than others who were concentrated wholly with one lender, be it a bank or farm credit or whatever. I mean, do you share that concern? And, and as you go through this period of, of restructuring that you're doing now, um, where liquidity is tighter, are you counseling your borrowers to, hey, you better look at multiple credit sources if you're in a position of use? So can I rephrase it just slightly so that uh, part of this has to do with the concentration of the banking industry. Uh, is there concern about that in rural America? And then do farmers need to look beyond you to other places uh, to have different lines of credit? Well, I'll take a shot at that first. Uh, well, both Bill and I went through the 80s and uh, cut our teeth on um, restructuring as it was in the 80s. And there's some differences now, but we know what that experience is like and remember what kind of things uh, got farmers in trouble. And I think you raise a good point. I think every farmer needs to be mindful of um, what kind of lender that they're dealing with, or have they been in and out of the market, or have they been, is their track record pretty consistent in the market? Um, true test of a lender is when a farmer's uh, got some, some challenges and, and kind of put them to the test. So I think it's important for farmers to look for lenders that are uh, dependable and have some kind of a track record. I think that's probably more important than whether or not they have multiple sources of lenders. Uh, I think to take more of a risk on whether or not they pick the right main lender than whether or not they split their credit up to different sources. Mm -hmm. I, I, I got a question on that. I'll, I will advise having multiple sources of lenders. Uh, I, would, I would take the other side of that. I think he's right on with a good relationship, but uh, it's your family at home. Keep that in mind. Uh, my question is, as I spill the water, but we've had people write in, are we checking the farm, there, there's worry. When I went back to that back slide where it says, where are we going to cut the acres? The question is, where are we going to cut the acres? That's the bottom line. How are we going to get prices higher? All of a sudden, we're the world's high-cost producer, so to speak. Where are we going to cut the acres? The whole entire Nebraska Bankers Association 
the Illinois Bankers does it. They ask me when I'm on stage, hey, who's going to cut the acres? When I fired right back, well, when the bankers going to quit lending? I mean, I, I went, we went through this housing crisis. There wasn't one home builder that quit building houses. I mean, there, there was no one stop until the banks stopped lending. Now, the question is, where are the banks at on the litmus test as far as the farmer's net worth? Are we going market to market? Because we've had a lot of guys write in and say, I'm feeling like this is very eerily similar to what we went through in the 80s, and people are telling us it isn't. The reason I say we're not market to market, that's what the housing bubble was about. We weren't testing, we weren't litmus testing net assets, market to market. A farmer, for instance, there are people in this room I know have written into me. Your net worth may be five million on the paper, but market to market, uh, when everyone's out selling John Deere equipment at the same time, or everyone's trying to move property at the same time, that uh, <laughs> we see what happened. And that's my question is, if, if you brought up a good point, uh, you know, if you don't have multiple relationships, I mean, are we testing those balance sheets? And, and the question every farmer in the room wants to know is, are you guys, if we have another year of $3 corn, and in another year, where's the money going to go? Are you guys going to keep lending? And where are we at on this? How deep are the pockets going to go? Now, I think everybody in the room has that question, because we've seen it all tight. I've had several guys get their lines cut, dramatic yeah. cuts, up north, specifically and down south, it, with banks who are tied to energy plays that have gotten ripped. So I think it's got everyone nervous, and that's the high question. How deep, where do you foresee money coming to you guys from if we keep drifting? Well, I mean, the, the environment, and going back to the other question just real quick, I mean, agriculture is still viewed by lenders in general as, as a uh, reasonably good place to lend money, and we see lots of competition today. We're a full-service lender. I'm not, you know, I'm probably the wrong one to ask about should you diversify your lending because we're a full-service lender. We'd like to see you do all your business with us, but we have, uh, we, we do split up the business too. Uh, but I would tell you that in most cases, if you're credit worthy and if you've got a, a competitive cost of production in your business, You've got at least two or three lenders available to you today at very reasonable uh, risk spreads in your interest rate. And that ties back to my comment earlier about we've got to keep crop insurance and we've got to keep some level of commodity program in place because I think that helps agriculture be viewed as a good risk uh, from a lender's let, perspective. Let me ask it in a different way. Two or three years ago, uh, would you have required crop insurance to make alone and do you this year in most instances? I think we have expected crop insurance to be in place. Required. Uh, we, but we rarely require it until we get to the point uh, that a customer's look, uh, working capital is completely gone and their solvency is a threat. We would require it then. But really we don't have to require it because at 95% of the producers in, in the upper Midwest and the high plains that we lend into take it anyway. Would we require it if, if the, we didn't have that higher percentage of participation? Absolutely we would. Now, What's not the for everybody, but for a large percentage of our customers, we would have to. What's the difference between available working capital today for the coming crop year and in the 2013 or 2012 season? Well, I would tell you that probably for 20% of our customers, they've completed that to concerning levels, and that's the, those that were focused on rebalancing. And back in 12, there's always a few that and, there's probably three or five. And across your system, where will that reduce acres? I'm not sure I they got an answer to where the acreage reduction comes from. Across your system, who has the least amount of working capital? Is there a part of the, part of the United States that does? Well, I, I landed the upper Midwest. I'm not sure I can respond. I think Joe or somebody else can talk about it. Joe, you want to talk about it? Anybody else been watching watching this? I know Gary Schmidt, you guys on campus. You know, we, we've been looking at this uh, as part of the work we do with Congress. We visit farmers all across the United States and all budgets and things. And we've been, we've actually, uh, this is something I've been looking at for at least the last six to eight years. Um, it's an interesting concept where lenders are willing, 
you know, back after the 80s, so it changed the rules, and it was, it was basically cash flow lending, and that worked really well during the good times, but now, and I, I get it, lenders kind of all the time, but now that things are tough, cash flow stuff's out the window, and as long as you have a lot of strong equity position, they're going to keep going with you for a while. So the really hard question, the hard question that, that really needs to be answered by somebody is, at what level do you cut people off? from just, because these prices, uh, unless Kevin can make you extra money marketing, these prices do not look like they're going to be at a profitable level for, for, for broadly. You know, there's certain individuals, but broadly. And so what are you going to do? You're going to sit there and eat your equity away until a point of, when do they get cut off with y'all? You know, I mean, what's, what's your standard? Well, I mean, I guess from, uh, we're cooperative. We're owned by the 60,000 customers that, that uh, borrow from us. And, uh, you know, our responsibility is to be there for the 58,000 that are left 10 years down the road or whatever the number uh, horses out to be. So, you know, when, when we've got a lot of equity in operation, we'll be patient now that and, and be lending them money until that equity and collateral position starts to threaten the capital position for the rest of our stockholders. I mean, that's the answer to your question. Now, in the meantime, though, we're going to be pushing those folks that we're sticking with to do things in their operation to get profitable, and you've got to find a way to be profitable at 370, at, at 375 point. That's the answer today. Now, maybe that number's not right. Maybe it's 350, but it is $4 or four and a quarter, and we may be continuing to loan money to those that have a cost of production of $4, but we're going to be pushing pretty hard uh, to find ways in their operation to get profitable at three fifty dollars or three seventy five dollars more. And, and, then, and then it's just a matter of time then, as things play out, uh, how long we can stay with someone. Uh, application around um, IP laws and seed technology because there's a number of inputs around that <coughs> an anchor equation where seed technology is the stubborn input. It won't come down in price. So part of that is we have allowed a lot of concentration in the seed technology around one or two companies. What are we doing in our policy application about so I, you're asking a similar question that's running through my mind based on the previous discussion before we got here too, which is, I mean, part of that, the way you take the art program, there was some assumption that, you know, that's coming down and you're paying this because you readjust. Well, how, where do you readjust the input costs and how? Which comes back almost a two-fold question on the technology, right? That does technology make that, that cost, does that bring that cost down? Does it do it in a timely manner? And the flip side of that, in my head, is how, do, how does this tightening then limit the farmer's ability to, to use the new technology or to advance, uh, you know, whatever the next decision or, you know, it, there's a weird, not weird, is it, and I don't have an answer to it because I don't know what, how those things move, but it does raise, I think, a really fascinating question about it. Does technology step in and help bring down the technical cost, but does it do it in a timely manner to the policy and program? And does it do it under a timely manner for the cost of uh, any other issues you may have? Too high, we need some relief. Our prices are too low, we can't afford to keep paying all this money. And, and so they're taking that concern. But what they sent back to us was in this regulatory environment that we're in, we've got to recoup our investment costs over a period of time. So if we can get the regulations eased up, then that'll provide an opportunity for them to pass along some of that savings uh, back to the farmers. But it's an ongoing discussion uh, that we're continuing to have. And then back to Kevin's earlier point. 
we're a short crop away from four dollar corn. And you gotta play the game to have to sell the corn. And so where the acres gonna come from, I don't know. You may see acre reallocation, uh, more beans, uh, less corn, but you know, you gotta you gotta be in the game to play. <laughs> Just one quick comment on that. You know, Benson Hill is trying to drive these costs down and sees an opportunity to innovate the question is who else can be held up? They'll innovate. The, the big farms are obviously going to do every single thing they can to come to the government and slow Benson Hill down. That's what they do every single time. So the way you cut costs, the way you get input, the way you reduce the spending of the federal government is to allow competition to ensue. And so I don't know the answer to this, but the thing I said to the Congress people I was with on Monday was stop worrying about how to spend money, worry about how to take away every single bit of regulation that's slowing down the events of Hill, a whole gamut, the other firms are coming online. And if people can give me feedback on what those things are, I'll work it. But, but that's the list that I think folks in D.C. need to work on. That's the list we need to work on in the industry. It's not going to solve them all quickly, but it's the only way to solve them properly. The final question for each of you is uh, how do you see, uh, who do you see being the farmer in 2050? How does that change? But I'm going to let you think about that. Are farmers in the audience all hold up their hands again? Every farmer in the audience hold up your hand. Okay, now, uh, all, no, keep them up. Keep them up. All of you that are going to put more acres in soybeans this spring, leave your hand up. That's probably two-thirds of them. That's a pretty good indication right there. Okay, who's going to be the farmer by the time we get to 2015? How does automation change it? How does availability of credit uh, change it? How does the thinking out of America change it? How do the daughters and sons that aren't going into the business because it's cost too much or can't get into the business because it costs too much to change it by 2015? We'll start with you, John, and we'll the American Well, we've, we've seen the, we've got 2.1 million farms across the United States today. Uh, we, we see farm numbers continue to decline. So what does a farmer look like in 2050? Uh, it, it might be, you know, two cohorts. One is your, your large, farmer utilizing economies of scale, and another may be your smaller farmer and you start utilizing the, the niche marketing, uh, direct marketing channels and ag technology to, to, to market that particular product. USDA already says medium-sized farmers are on their way out of the street. Jonathan? Uh, tough question. I mean, on a personal note, I don't you understand my brothers, but um, the uh, I think the, the rule, the challenge in rural America, what all the technology is going to do, and how that that change. I mean, each time we've gone through these rough patches, we've we've trimmed out a lot of farmers over time. There may be 2.1 million farms, but there's not that many farmers out there. And so, you know, how I, I don't know what it looks like. I think a good point really is that you've got to get you've got to increase your intelligence on what you're using with. Technology, management, and marketing, all of that is, is going to be key on who survives through whatever and how long this downtime lasts. Jonathan Coppice is from the University of Illinois. Joe Outlaw is from Texas A&M. Well, I, I, my first guess would be that, uh, well, first of all, you should be uh, really excited the fact that uh, this audience is one of the youngest audiences I've talked to in a long time. <laughs> And, and even there, there's, you know, there's sprinkled of lots of gray, I guess. But the reality is, it's going to be either the younger guys in this room or their children, because that's the only way you get into agriculture these days, because of the investment costs. And, you know, it's, it's to me, as an economist who steps around and thinks about all this stuff, it's the people who are able to figure out how to manage their, their costs so they can stay nimble and make investments whenever things turn up, uh, when they will turn up. Uh, unfortunately, in agriculture, the only way we generally, unless we have a drought, the only way we get prices up is by driving people out. And uh, those people, you know, we've done that over, over time, and then basically it's, it's difficult because at this, at this point in time, everybody in this room is efficient. The question is who's going to be the most nimble in the adjustments. Mike Heckner from Kovac. You know, I think it's easy to say we're going to see more consolidation. That's always the answer. 
And indeed, I think that there will be some transformation of some land ownership as the rocks get a little bumpier ahead. Um, but that doesn't mean that every farmer is going to be a big farmer. We're going to see most of the production from big farms, but there will be an existence of smaller farmers. Uh, some can be small and debt free and don't have to make a lot of money. And so there, I think that says that the, that middle may start to get squeezed out. We'll see that uh, the demographics change a little bit. And there could be private investment that's still interested in coming into land ownership or some form of a partnership. You know, farming's a couple of different things. One is the ownership of the assets. The other is the trade and ability to produce. So maybe we'll start to see some of the vision of that. And Bill Davis. Yeah, I'd probably uh, close. I wouldn't argue that I think we'll see consolidation at both ends of the spectrum. But today we see producers that, that can be low cost, efficient, and profitable in all size categories. And I would hope by 2050 that uh, we see a complete transition of, of ag production agriculture where everybody that's in business on the operating side views it as a business and knows their costs and, and can be profitable. Uh, at whatever size range it used to be in. I think we're seeing a trend towards that now. Uh, less, it's, it's, less, it's more run like a business than it was 30 years ago when I got started in this business. And I can see trend to more in that future. Show your appreciation to the folks up here. Thank you very much.